morning, evening, afternoon, depending on where you all are, because I've heard you're from like all over the place. So let me begin with a, a land acknowledgement. So I acknowledge the ancestral and traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and Huron Windat who are its original owners and custodians upon the lands in which I am gathered. And I live here in Takaranto, um, in the uh, province of Ontario here in Canada. Um, the, doing a land acknowledgement is a really important part of like uh, OCAD University's commitment to decolonization, which I will talk to you more about. Uh, just for reference, OCAD University is the oldest and largest art and design institution in Canada. Um, and it's the third largest art and design institution in North America. Um, again, as, as Hank wonderfully introduced, um, I'm the first black and black female dean of a faculty design anywhere. Um, I'm a design anthropologist. So again, look at culture and design. I'm African-American by heritage. So you may not be able, my, I've traveled many places so my accent's a little messed up, but I'm generally African-American. And all of those things are kind of important because it influences the way in which I experience and look at design. So I'm going to talk to you about decolonizing design. I'm going to talk to you about some of the steps that we've been taking at OCAT University to, to change, to change the way we think about and approach design. Um, and um, to start on, I'm going to talk about respectful design. So. Um, at OCAD University and the faculty design, our ethos is called respectful design. And it comes out of this understanding of being, Toronto is one of the most diverse cities in the world. Um, that design is, and it's a design city, it's like the third largest sort of um, design center in North America as a city. And so as an, as an anthropologist, I'm always interested in the relationship between the values that people have, the way they are sort of may manifest through design and then whether or not people are actually experiencing those values. And so one of the things that we've been looking at and have looked at is actually the way in which um, design itself has been quite disrespectful <laughs> um, to certain communities and particularly Black, Indigenous and P people of color communities and the land in and of itself. So when we talk about sustainability, we're talking about the fact that design has been disrespectful to the land. But those these are all kind of related together. And so a lot of what I'm going to walk you through is, is some of, of the harms that design has, has done. Um, but then I'm going to talk to you about like how we can make amends for those um, harm and the work that the students are doing at OCAD University with their faculty um, to be able to address the way in which design can be respectful instead of disrespectful. And again, the driver for all of this is that many of my Black, Indigenous, and POC students feel like they must choose between their beautiful, diverse, and nuanced identities and being a professional designer. And the reason why they have that sort of thing is that the values of design have been and are, but is changing, right? Um, colonial, and I'll talk about how that works out, um, white supremacist, patriarchal, and capitalist. And these are some of the values that have been quite harmful um, to many communities, um, like again, not just in North America, but also globally. Um, so now I'm going to just set some terms that help us with our discussion. Um, so one of the things to kind of understand around like how design has been harmful is that it's been in a particular context and then particularly the context of a settler colonial state. So both Canada and the United States and other places I've lived like Australia, these are settler colonial states. And what that means is that there's kind of three historically and contemporarily three major positionalities in that state. There are the indigenous people um, who are, again, the original custodians of the land. There have been settlers who have come to lands that have not been their indigenous lands in order, in many ways, to build a better life. And then they've set up systems of enslavement of in the context of Canada and the United States, indigenous people were enslaved, but mostly it's been people from um, Africa 
um, who were enslaved and brought over into the settler colonial state to basically to take um, to take advantage of their labor. Um, what's important to understand in terms of the relationship to the land in the settler colonial state is that the land has been stolen and pillaged. Um, and the other thing to understand is that policies have been put in place um, to uh, facilitate assimilation. And that assimilation has often meant genocide um, against people who are non-Europeans. And this kind of comes out of like a wonderful essay, if you haven't seen it, called Decolonization is Not a Metaphor by Eve Tuck and W.K. Yang. So if you haven't checked that out, do check that out because it sets out some of the things. So um, design is implicated in the settler colonial state. There's a way in which sometimes we think about design um, quite innocently or without a level of sort of criticality, but we have to, in order to sort of decolonize, we have to look at things kind of critically. So again, indigenous peoples, their relationship to the land is that they are the original custodians of the land. And then their relationship to assimilationist policies that they have had to actively fight against assimilation for over 500 years. And the way in which this has kind of manifests itself critically right now here in Canada is that um, many, um, the bodies of, 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 of unburied, um, bodies of kids, youth, indigenous children have been found on the grounds of what were residential schools that were established to basically um, uh, enact a cultural genocide against indigenous uh, people. So separate them from their communities, their language, their culture in order to force them into assimilation into sort of white, white culture. Um, and so these exist in the United States and actually the model for the residential school is actually found at Carlisle um, um, School in Pennsylvania. Um, but right now, again, that they're uncovering so far, they've been discovered just here in North America over the bodies of over 7,000 kids um, who were forced to assimilate and then again, died in that process of assimilation through this. So how does this relate to design? So in design, one of the common challenges that we face is issues of appropriation and misappropriation, and particularly the misappropriation of indigenous motifs. So the example in the image here is in um, 2015, uh, the fashion, the British fashion label K2Z, um, stole the sacred designs by a Canadian Inuit shaman named Awa. Um, and again, what, why does this keep happening? Like every week, every month, there feels like there's a controversy around the misappropriation of indigenous teeth and why this keeps happening is related to the attitudes of a settler colonial state, because that sense of like entitlement that I can take these sacred motifs is based on the underlying notion that again, there's no indigenous people. There's no indigenous people to whom a community that to whom I need to be in consultation with or negotiation with in relationship to using the aspects of it. In many cases, their sacred indigenous culture. And so it's a part of a long line of like taking away the land from indigenous people, separating them for their language, separating them for their culture, which again, indigenous people have fought for over 500 years, but the attitude of entitlement that allows this kind of appropriation and misappropriation to continue to happen is that underlying attitude that there are no indigenous people here for me to negotiate with. And so understandably in the context of when we're trying to teach my indigenous students design and there's a new controversy around, uh, you know, anthropology, stealing, uh, 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 a motif from the Navajo community or um, someone taking a sacred design from the Anishinaabe people. That these kinds of debates then make design feel like a field that is not safe to the indigenous. And so there's work that needs to be done in terms of understanding, again, the way in which design participates in the harm of indigenous people so that we can make amends. The example next is of sort of the Black community. Um, so again, in generally in relationship that they've 
were historically brought involuntarily to the land uh, to work as enslaved um, laborers. Uh, that and because of the structures of white supremacy, that they are unassimilatable in terms of the settler colonial state. And one of the things that I discovered just a few years ago is like white supremacy has like a date and time. Like it happened in, you know, uh, like um, Maryland and Virginia in uh, eight, uh, 1681, in which anti miscegenation laws were established to basically take the rights of then of like blacks, free, enslaved black, free blacks, native people, um, anyone who is not white and Christian and basically downgrade their rights so that they couldn't vote, that they couldn't um, marry with one another, um, that they couldn't appear in a court of law against the sort of white Christian male. Um, and so white supremacy established at that time that the opposite identity to whiteness was blackness. And again, design participates in this process. So one of the things I always talk about, especially in our industrial design classes, is the cotton gin. So the cotton gin was a device that was created by Eli Whitney in like, uh, I think 17, uh, 1794. Um, and what it did is it removed um, the fibers um, and the seed, it separated the fibers and the seed from cotton so that you could use it um, for textile mills. Um, so again, that um, Eli Whitney graduated from Yale, had to pay his debts, started to working on a plantation in the South, um, noticed the challenge of that, developed this device, tried to patent it. Um, and again, with the sole intent of efficiency as a value and um, with the sole intent to make money. And the direct like implications of that is that um, at the time in which this was sort of developed, um, slavery was actually beginning to wane in the United States because it was becoming more and more expensive. And so um, in uh, at the time there was probably like 750,000 slaves. Um, by the time, because of the cotton gin and the uh, quote unquote efficiencies that it gained in which um, an enslaved person, instead of taking an entire day to separate the fibers and the seeds, it could be done in one hour, that then um, more farmland was bought because now it was more efficient and more profitable to grow cotton. Um, so more land was ex expropriated from indigenous peoples. Um, and then um, more slaves were imported so that by the time you get to 1850, there's like 3.2 million enslaved Africans um, in the United States. And this is by design. Like Eli Whitney knew this was going to happen um, when he invented uh, the cotton gin. It was his intention. And so again, how do you have a conversation about design and how design is for good when again in the context of your your communities um like design has done some really harmful things and then in terms of again uh poc and people of color in this context again it's not the most um nuanced terms but it helps to show kind of the solidarities that exist in the in in terms of the histories of immigration of those who have um, Asian heritage, so South Asian heritage, East Asian heritage, Southeast Asian heritage, of Latinx, of um, Middle Eastern, of anyone who's sort of a non-Black, non-Indigenous, and non-European, um, to talk about the fact that in many cases what is similar between these groups is that they've had to escape their homes to become new settlers on the land. and depending on their education, their skin color, their sort of family networks, that in terms of assimilation, they've actually made some, sometimes make difficult choices um, and have the privilege of choice to choose to assimilate, to become part of the mainstream. And, but again, that doesn't save them from discrimination or, or again, uh, from the harms of design. So again, this is a, you have, this is an advertisement for magic washer powder. 
Um, and it's basically celebrating the passage of the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, which forbid um, um, Chinese people from coming over to the United States, impose sort of a head tax, all of these sort of things uh, set structural discrimination in place for those who were here. Um, and you have, again, an advertising brand uh, celebrating that, endorsing that. And again, you have then the conversation of like, how has design done harm in terms of like the stereotypes that is perpetuated against different people in terms of, again, the way in which it's reinforced policies that have been harmful to specific communities. Um, now that I've talked about this, the thing to understand is that, you know, decolonization is about indigenous land sovereignty. Um, but for us in design, it requires that we liberate design from what we've termed the modernist project. And basically it has two parts of it. Um, and this kind of comes out of discourse about design and technology in the 1800s from Europe that talks about like progress through technology by bringing luxury to the masses and then dropping this notion of your national and ethnic baggage to join universal design. And in the context of Europe in the 1800s, this is revolutionary, right? That the ideal of, of the peasantry, right? Um, that the laborers who are working in the mines and things in the 1800s of being able to have better things, to live in better houses, to have better food, to have better things through technology enabling things to produce, be produced faster and cheaper, quite revolutionary. In the context of Europe, that's constantly have been at war. They're still at war. They've just had an economic war, right? But they're still at war for thousands and thousands of years. The ideal of, let's say, drop your German, <laughs> drop your Italian and become part of like a universal mankind. So there was a gendered notion with that. Again, quite revolutionary. And to the fact that certain um, design centers like the Bauhaus endorse this kind of understanding that they were kicked out of Europe and came to places like the United States um, and to, to, to bring these revolutionary ideas. But in the context of colonization, this modernist design project becomes colonization 2.0 because in order to get things faster and cheaper, in the context of colonization, it's because it's cheap because you've taken indigenous land. Um, it is faster because you're taking the excess labor of those communities that have been enslaved. Um, it is the ideal of giving up your ethnic baggage becomes cultural genocide, right? Cultural genocide where again, the, the histories of making of other communities and, and becomes erased because it's not fitting within this narrow notion of modernist design. And again, as an art and design institution in Canada, um, that's almost as old as Canada, OCAD University has done harm. So these are some of the posters from the Canadian National Railway that was developed by Franklin Carmichael who's um, one of the group of seven painters and was a student and, and as well as an instructor at Ontario College of Art, which is what we were before we added design. And so again, these posters are like, this is the, the group of seven painters really put OCAD University and Canada on the map. But the images that they're perpetuating are those again of colonization. The message of Canadian National Railway is Europeans leave Europe and come to Canada because um, where you can build your uh, beautiful life, um, basically still on the land of indigenous people who are being erased, right? Who are being um, uh, undergoing processes of assimilation um, as well as decimation through conflict, war and disease. So we've had to take this all into account and I hope you're not feeling too depressed about design because now this is the part where we, where we tell the story of like how we begin to make amends. 
And so at OCAD University, we've taken all this into account, right? We teach about this, we talk about this, we have the conversation, and we've done a lot of work to make amends, to address the way in which design has been harmful and make it something that is an act of healing, both individually as well as community. So one of the first things we've done is put indigenous demands first. Um, so these are some just some of the images from our first Indigenous cluster hire that was concluded in 2018 as part of our academic plan, which um, the first principle of that plan was decolonization. And in this process, we've, we've walked to and tried to understand what decolonization meant to us as a community, what is it meant to our Indigenous students and faculty. We've brought in Indigenous faculty. So in the Faculty of Design, we've gone from in the last five years having zero Indigenous faculty to having um, seven Indigenous faculty members. And this is changing our way we think about design. So there's a picture here of like a buffalo. Um, and the buffalo is tied to, in terms of like uh, indigenous ways of knowing and particularly the Anishinaabe seven grandfather teachings with the teaching of respect. And one of my faculty members, Howard Monroe, who's of Métis, um, one of the indigenous groups of Canada, he's redefined the design process to be aligned with the seven grandfather teachings. And so he's aligned the respect teaching with our analyze and research phase, because analysis and research is about understanding what you, where you positioned, what it is that you don't know, but having respect for the knowledge of others who name, name, may know more um, about a particular topic than you do. So that's just one of the, and this, again, this is manifests itself in our project. So this is an image of Sagandagar, who's uh, Dr. Sagandagar, who's one of my um, faculty in the advertising program. Um, and one of the projects that she assigned to her students was uh, this called the next buzzword. And so the students have picked out a cause or a trend. They select a brand to support it to do some research. Um, including a SWOT analysis, and then develop a, a design um, that is related upon this. And in the course, we bring in our Indigenous colleagues um, to talk about, again, how does this fit with like this decolonial project that we're doing. And so one of the teams worked with the uh, organization called the Peace Collective, which is uh, works, again, by trying to embed more indigenous language and understanding um, within within Canada and particularly within Toronto, and so um, so in that they develop these posters that talk about sort of things that are um, common um, in the city of Toronto, but the fact that they have indigenous names. So Toronto is actually Takaranto in the Mohawk language. But um, uh, Miscare, which is one of the parks, is actually from um, Mississaugas of the Credit, one of the Ojibwe language group speakers. Um, I actually live off of the street called Spadina, um, but it's Eshpadane, uh, which is from the Anishinaabe, one of the language groups. And so they developed this poster set, they developed a website, all of which, again, is trying to put Indigenous first. Um, and in terms of our understanding of what design is and what it can do with and for communities. Second thing we had to do was own up to our own institutions, racism and white supremacy. So there was a presidential tax force on underrepresentation that allowed us to understand how the lack of diversity that existed within the institution. But we had to have conversations. So we had workshops around like whiteness without white supremacy, because at that time, still 80% of my faculty were white. Um, so understanding where whiteness fits in, um, this process of transformation, what white supremacy is, um, was an important part for us to be able to rethink our identities and the basis of design um, that we use um, from our identities. And so we, we talked about a lot about white supremacy culture and what are the values of the organization um, and the institution and how we bring those forward in design. We had to establish authentic relationships with BIPOC communities. So this is of course pre-COVID, but this is me as the Dean of Design 
being everywhere that the Black community wanted or needed me to be to support their initiatives. And so um, when I arrived, I spent like two years going to First Fridays, which is a networking group. We established things to support Black community, like Black Reach Design Workshops for 8 to 12 year olds. Um, uh, the one of the projects that we've done re most recently is the Solid Black Collective, which is made up of like four of our Black faculty in design. Uh, established work to, with Black youth to develop a vaccinate for the culture program uh, to promote COVID vaccine. Um, and how, again, by getting vaccinated, you contribute to Black lives. And so built a community partnership with the Jamaican Canadian Association um, and the Black Physicians Association. And so in the image, uh, three of my of the members of the Solid Black Collective are there. So at the bottom, uh, bottom of the first row is um, Angela Baines, uh, the sort of uh, top row in the second, so the top row in the second column is Kathy Moscow. And then um, here in the third row is Keston Cornwall. And then here small in the corner is the fourth one is uh, Michael Lee Foy. And so these are the new faculty members that we brought into our first Black Cluster hire at OCAD University. And again, they're, they set up the marketing workshops with, um, on again, working through Zoom with community um, and then these, all these posters were created by the youth um, in their own language, using the visuals that they wanted to connect with community. And then the campaign uh, was in, in, in June to September. There was lots of websites and um, Instagram impressions. There was four weeks that it was on advertising at the Toronto Transit Corporation. Um, so again, just how do we use design to, to make amends to the harms that have been done through community? And another example of this is the Design With project that's run by Ronnie Lee. Um, so she is of um, Chinese heritage, but, but grew up in the Philippines. And so she does a lot of participatory, for multiple years, she's been doing this participatory design project in Regent Park, which is one of our um, most diverse uh, communities in, in Toronto, um, in which she's partnered with uh, um, the Regent Park Sewing Circle, which is made of newly immigrant women. Um, and so the students come together and learn, pre-COVID, learned on their classroom was at Regent Park at the center. Um, and then they work on designs that are based with the community and then the um, the women of the sewing circle then um, develop and manufactures those designs by again collaborating with the students around what again things that can be done for uh, Regent Park that's of Regent Park for Regent Park and by the women of Regent Park who again sell these sell the designs um, and their uh, manufacturing of them into um, into the Regent Park community. And then in terms of like rehiring, we've made our calls about BIPOC community interests, not just our own. Um, so when we did the Black Cluster hire, we were like, we want someone who does Black speculative futures. We want someone who does multi-sensory storytelling on Black representation. We want someone who's in Black hip hop or other Black cultural aesthetics. And that sort of has shifted our, the practices, not just at OCAD University, but actually other universities um, throughout uh, North America. So now there's many um, Indigenous Black cluster hires that are held and they use that same language of like, how do I speak the language of the community that I'm trying to embrace? And again, we did it with our most recent Indigenous cluster hire as well, where we selected, like we didn't talk about sustainability, but we talked about water and land protection because that's the way in which the community speaks about those processes. And we changed our qualifications. So generally we always look for a traditional academic that assumes that people have been fully embedded in post-secondary institutions, which means like we've never really addressed um, systemic exclusion. So now when we look for like our top candidates, we look for top candidates who might be a traditional academic as a persona type or a Praxis star where again, they may not have had access to post-secondary institutions, but through like design media workshops that they've given, 
through um, through the promotion of the projects and things that they've done through talks and publications or whatever. They're doing all the things that we look for the traditional academic but they're doing it in a context in which they've been excluded from post-secondary and so they've shined in a different way. And a community connector is another group that again, might do the, be doing the work through community program, youth program or adult education or have a religious education role, doing the kind of things that we look for in design, but outside of that design, industry design context or outside of that academic design context. And then we've been hiring for critical mass. So again, these are the top is the faculty, um, the black faculty at OCAD University as of June the 3rd, 2020. There's actually more than that now. Um, and then the bottom is the indigenous faculty just within the faculty of design um, that we've hired as of 2021. So just recently. And so actually um, the person, uh, Pia Kea here, who's the, in, the, in the blue shirt um, with the thing, he just actually arrived yesterday <laughs> Um, from Hawaii to begin teaching. So the way in which we've addressed things, we've put indigenous demands first, we've addressed our racism, we've est established authentic relationship with BIPOC communities. When we call for people, we call based on the community's interests. We've changed our standards to take into account systemic exclusion, and we're aiming for critical mass so that every student feels like they can again, um, draw from their cultural heritage background and have faculty members who can represent and support the work they want to do based on that heritage. So that is it in terms of the formal presentation. I hope I left you enough time for lots of questions. You did. Um, st uh, staff are the um... Are the microphones? Um... Yeah, we're ready to roll. Anytime anybody has a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, I actually had, so I've never heard of the seven um, grandfather principles, I think is what you called it earlier. Mm -hmm. um, is it something I can Google or I'm just like, yeah, curious, I don't know what that means. It's the seven grandfather teachings um, okay. is what it's called. And it's, um, I can tell you what they are. Um, they're humility, bravery, honesty, wisdom, truth, respect, and love. Um, but again, it's a thing where if you Google it, you'll there's lots of different resources that will show up. Um, they're very regional specific. So it's a thing where you're like, wherever you're at, there may be a regional version of that. So like do, do, do search around a little bit. Um, but again, those are the things that we're 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 embedding. Um, again, understanding design just not as an output, but design as an internal cultivation of the kind of person you want to be in the world, right? Okay, cool. Thank you. Welcome. Um, I have kind of a question and something that I've been thinking a lot, um, just from a strategy perspective. So in the world right now, a lot of um, people in technology, myself included, are able to work remotely. And I've definitely seen and been served up a lot of ads um, from different like islands and countries that are trying to at attract that, that type of tech talent because you know, you think from an economic perspective, that's like, you know, new capital that can move into the country. However, um, there's also the potential cultural clashes that that could happen. And I'm, you know, looking at these six steps and I think definitely number one, like putting indigenous demands first. Um, but, you know, say for example, like as a strategist, if, you know, I were to go to, um, you know, the city of uh, Mexico City, and say like, I would like to put a proposal together to attract, you know, tech workers um, to Mexico City who can work remotely. You know, what what things do you think that I would need to keep in mind in order to make mm -hmm. sure I'm not just bringing like droves of Americans and other North Americans to Mexico City that um, are potentially like disrupting the environment that, that others are living in? Um, so within that, there's, there's a, there's a few things that I always think about in that sense. Because again, I've like 
really global traveled. I've lived in different places. And so, in a, and again, setting up infrastructure, right, in a lot of those places. So some of the things I always take into account is, is, is again, um, Indigenous first, building relationships with the local Indigenous community. Um, and that takes time and it's a hard work because there's lots of mistrust. But if you do all the things to build that trust, then that then then what you have is structures of accountability so that if you are doing something harmful, they will call you out. Like, like I know that I've built good relationships here in Canada because I get called out for anything that I do <laughs> that is potentially harmful. And, and, and for them to call me out, like, again, that's an act of love because it's saying, so you're doing something that might hurt, hurt us and hurt our relationships. So I'm going to tell you what it is and not just ignore you and run away and find some other way to whatever. I'm going to tell you what it is because I want to stay in relationship with you, right? So I always try to establish that. So when I moved to Australia, right, I've, you know, one of the things I did was make sure I stayed grounded with the indigenous community there so that they could call me out if I'm doing something harmful. And then the rest of it is that once you have like, again, local, I would say local accountability partners, then, then it becomes easier, right? Cause it's like, if your salaries that you're paying is disrupting the salary scale, then they will call you out on that, right? If you're, um, if you're importing too many people who are not sharing the right values or you're not helping the local people to level up to the skills that, again, you know, that they're wanting to develop, then they'll call you out on that. Um, so, so again, there's a, it, it's, a, it's a hard process to do that because there's lots of reasons for mistrust. But once you establish those relationships, those authentic relationships, then you don't have to worry about knowing what to do because you're in relationship with people who will tell you what you need to do. And then you just need to be humble and listen, right? Just cap, develop the humility to listen to that and to, and again, when you're in good people, you can have the conversation and debate. Uh, but when it comes down to like acting, then you act in accord to what's gonna what's gonna strengthen that relationship. Right? Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hello, Dr. Dory. Hi. Hi, my question is about um, being the only person of color in the room. Um, so I had an experience where the idea that was on the table was a really good idea, but no one else was recognizing that the effects it could have on the people in the community. Um, this was like for outdoor advertising. Mm -hmm. So I brought up this idea and I felt like I could see the faces of the people on the Zoom, like this is the first time they even considered that, oh yeah, those people <laughs> would be affected by you know us placing this out of home here. So like, I was just wondering what to do in that kind of situation, like how to help people understand um, that they have to consider more than just like their target audience for their campaign and like how, what, like, what kind of language or what resources I could use in those instances. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on like the situation, let's say there's very different strategies that I've used. Um, so like it might be a thing where um, let's say in, in one, depending on like, again, what's going on, like there may be a scenario where like I, I would raise something and just for whatever reason, people can't hear me. So in that situation, what I normally do is I, f I find allies, right? So I always say like, I try to find, you know, like, Again, this is this is changing. So I want to say this is changing, but I say I try to find like a white male as an ally, and you know a white female as an ally, or amplify like if there's other racialized people there, you know like let's let's all get into this together, so that the ideal can be heard, right? Um, and, and again, there's takes a lot of humility, right, to do that. But again, this is the part where it's like, I need to swallow my ego because what I need is for that message to be heard so that that change can happen, right? So it, if, it, if it means that it's not me, I just need to like hold space for that because this is more important than my ego at the moment, right? 
So that's one strategy that I use. Again, when I've had, um, when I might be the only black one, but I'm not the only, only one. There's one of my colleagues, Ryan Rice, who was indigenous. And we made a pact with each other, kind of where it says like, you know what, in the room, I'll bring up as a black person, all the indigenous issues. And then you as like the indigenous person, the black issues, because we're gonna like, if I say it or you say it or whatever, whatever, like they'll listen, but they won't listen, listen. So then we can reify each other's positionality in such a way that, again, they kind of have to listen. First of all, they'll be shocked to hear me say something that's about indigenous people and not black people. So they'll be paying attention to that, but then you can echo in and we change the, the sort of bit of discussion. So that's a strategy that's used. Um, and then, and then the last part, I mean, the last strategy is that, you know, over time, you know, I build up trust <laughs> within, uh, within my organization. And again, you know, like I come with power, so <laughs> there is an aspect there, but I'm saying, but a lot of that comes with trust where, and again, my therapist and I had a long conversation where she's like, Dory, you have to show them because we talk about leadership is like, you should be stoic. And, and, you know, and I was trying to cultivate that and she's like, no, 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 you need to show them what's going on in your face. You need to show them what you're feeling because they're looking for you to understand whether something they said is actually harmful. Right. So we're at the point in our community now where nobody wants to do harm. Right. We were like, no harm, do no harm. So if I make a face, or I raise an eyebrow, or I even say something that says this is going to be harmful, then then we're not at a point now of trust where they can hear that and we and it shifts the decision. It shifts the decision making. The beautiful thing that's happening now is that we've become so sensitized as a community that I don't have to even say anything. Someone else will say, this thing's whacked. <laughs> and then I just get to echo it like, yeah, I was thinking the same thing, right? And then and then the decision changes. So there's many different strategies that I've had to use depending on like level of power I have, whether level of trust that I have, my ability to build allyship. But if you're in a place where you can't build allyship, if you're in a place where that trust isn't there, and again, the trust has to be earned and it's mutual. But that like I was like, that's normally an indication that that's not in a place you should be right that's not in a place that you should be and so you know save yourself and disengage <laughs> if you can if you can thank you those are really thoughtful and creative strategies <laughs> hi dr dory um i have hi. a question in the chat that i want to ask you sure um, it states, there are many minority communities with extremely talented designing skills across the globe what future efforts do you see schools making to bridge those connections and bring them the tools they need? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> interesting, because I was like one of the conversations I was having with an institution this morning. Um, there's, I mean, so 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 again, this becomes a thing where you have to be really careful because you don't want to be like have a savior complex right and and things are sophisticated enough that you just don't talk about white saviors it's like no any savior complex right um so so let's say if you're if you've listened to the community and they've said this is what we want and need and you're providing these kinds of things there are lots of projects and programs that are, are doing that kind of work and they have been for for a while so i think that that aspect isn't new the thing that's new is like the awareness of it um the thing that's new is like like again i did my field work in um uh ethiopia um and you know like because there's been a lot of ethiopians in the diaspora like they've all gone well not so much now because of like the the conflict but they went home and built their tech hubs in addis ababa and all these different places so there's that there's that aspect of of like i always try to say whenever i'm engaging with a community or anyone is like my job is never to do something that can already be done locally my value has to be additive in some ways that I'm providing some resources or some access that that 
that is not available locally and the local people want me to make them available right make available and so whatever enterprise project or things that you have i've always i've always designed them around filling in some gap that is needed and desired by the local community and then doing it that way so that means um you know at ocad we had these study abroad um projects that a faculty member had done in like india and all these different places and you know through this process of transformation they were like i have to stop doing projects in india because there's no way i don't have the partnerships i don't have the thing to not do them in a colonial way so they actually did the research to figure out like okay there's some organizations that are working outside of peru there's some organizations that are working outside of these other places that actually are um, in line with more of these decolonial practices that we were wanting to put in place. And so we switched in some ways, like our relationships and our providers of those kinds of study abroad experiences because we took serious that, um, you know, like we're wanting to build relationships over long term. So we don't want a project where it's like you come in for, uh, three to six weeks and and you never see these people ever again. Like, like we don't want to set up those kinds of relationships. We don't want to bring in like, you know, tools and materials of things that are already there locally. But at the same time, we want to be careful about what we do bring in, that we're not bringing in something that can't be sourced, in, at least in the wider area, if they want that practice to continue right like because we don't want to be a situation where they have to import everything in order to make it happen right so these are a lot of the considerations that 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 we have taken in relationship to kind of like how we how we engage globally because again we're global citizens we want to engage globally an important part of education is about learning about different ways of thinking and being and having respect for that uh, but you have to do it in a way that is, again, <laughs> respectful. And so we work very hard at trying to understand locally what are the parameters of respect. Um, and then, you know, but also self-respect for ourselves in the sense of not putting ourselves in a situation where, where again, especially for us, for students, will students get hurt from the process of engagement as well? I hope it's a little bit abstract, but I would hope that was hopeful. <laughs>because it's based on some assumption of someone else who isn't me. So, okay, how do I respond to that? Like, well, okay, I can extract what is valuable out of this. So let's say, for example, we spend a lot of time, we have spent, this is changing, right? We spend a lot of time with like the Bauhaus in design, right? And again, it's one of those things where, where it's like, but I'm not a European male in the, you know, turn of the century. I haven't suffered the trauma of World War One. Um, these aesthetic motifs actually don't resonate with me in any way, shape, or form, except for like all of the propaganda that I get through 
you know, Dwell magazine. <laughs> and and so I go from that discomfort to say like, why am I not, why? And then most of that discomfort is like, why can't I see myself in this? If design is this like universal practice, why can't I see myself in this? And then, and then, you know, I then understand why design has told the story of it being this particular way. I unpack that, but then I, I insert myself into it. I put myself into it. Like, and there's again, really beautiful work that's being done. Like I think of, um, you know, one of my, um, one of my, uh, one of the students at OCAD um, last year did this project where he's of Lebanese heritage and um and google and um particularly whatsapp are really important tools in like in lebanon of connection and connectivity but it there but even like but there was nothing that was done like in the arabic script so he went first of all rebranded the google brand um and created he had to create his own typeface that was like related to that could work in Arabic and, and Latin script. So designed his own typeface, rebranded Google um, in Arabic because it wasn't, Google wasn't done in Arabic and then created all these like sort of, um, you know, typefaces and interfaces that, that would be useful to his Lebanese community and the diaspora, right? And so that's him coming from this like, we have to use this all the time and this doesn't speak to me doesn't speak to my community and not so like i'm gonna make a project to make google speak to my people right um and has won all kinds of awards in doing that and like again i presented the work actually uh to google saying you need to hire this <laughs> the student uh because he just solved a bunch of problems for you right and so so all of it that spark normally comes from that feeling of like why doesn't this why does this not resonate with me why do i feel uncomfortable and that discomfort normally comes from like again why don't i see myself in this and there's so many different ways to do it like again if you come from like a working class background let's say for example you know like that might be enough for you to feel like that discomfort right um if you come, you know, like I, if you have any kind of physical or cognitive differences, that might be enough for you to like feel that, that, that difference. So, we, I mean, we pay a lot of attention to like gender and race, um, um, but there are so many different points of differences that can be that spark of innovation, right? The innovation comes in making this design accountable to who you are and the other people that you love, right? Um, who might be like you. Awesome, thank you. I, I also want to add, um, uh, this is another question. Giving that opportunity and really that mindset and looking for that spark that will bring you move forward, how you bring institutions and people of power just trying to portray and really elevate that mindset uh, and expand it on an XYZ location. Yeah. So this is, you know, like, like student advocacy, like all the things that I talked about, all these six steps that we take, like none of that happened without student, student advocacy. Because again, if you're an art and design institution, or again, even if you're a commercial institution and you're trying to figure out like, how do I sell to the next generation? Like, again, there's, there's a, that your, your voice, your demand to say, I want a design education that's accountable to who I am. I want a product that is accountable to who I am. Like none of this transformation happens without that kind of advocacy. And the work that again, I've done as an administrator is make sure that there's enough faculty that are there that when, when you say, I want to make this change that they're like, okay, let me help you level up and make this change. Right. Or, um, so my, the, most of the role of administration is just getting the structures out of the way that to allow the advocacy of what the students want to happen in the institution. So my thing is like, if you, the thing that you can do most if you want this change to happen is to advocate, 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 advocate for this change. Awesome, thank you so much. And thank You're you for welcome. It.
Hello. Hi. question um specifically about what you just mentioned right now like um and, and thank you so much for the talk this is so interesting I'm so grateful for your global insight okay so um you just mentioned something about part of your role is to like make sure that the team has is providing like enough resources to each other to make like everyone level up or I don't know if you said everyone, but mm-hmm. um, basically my question is how, what is, what do you do? Like what, what helps you or like what, what do you, how, what is your approach when trying to uh, facilitate that? Yeah. I mean, so in terms of like getting resources, <laughs> in terms of getting resources, some of that is you know, a lot of that is just helping, helping the organization see where the priorities and the existing resources need to be, right? So, because a lot of the decisions you make is like, everyone has, again, all finances are finite, all resources are finite. So it's about what you decide are the priorities in terms of where you're gonna spend your resources. So as an institution, OCAD has said, we are going to spend our institution, our resources around diversity, inclusion, and decolonization, right? Again, we, OCAD, we don't, we, we are not a rich institution in any way, shape, or form, um, but of the limited resources we have, we've, we've decided, right, as a community, this is where we want to, this is where we want to focus our resources. The other thing that we do, like, again, is that then I, if, then I go out and I get additional resources, like being able to talk about the work that students are doing, like other people get excited. And so in that excitement, I'm like, you know, maybe not to you, but like if I'm giving the conversation to, you know, if I'm giving a presentation to, um, you know, Meta, (laughs) formerly known as Facebook, then I say, if you like what you've seen, then you can help us to continue to do this work by doing X, Y, and Z and providing these resources so that this work can continue. But again, that's my work as administration because that's resources and finances is always a barrier. So I'm either convincing internally that we should prioritize this this is where again student advocacy works because that because the norm, normal one most effective uh, leverage is to say and the students say this is where they want the priority to be as well right and then um, in terms again of external resources like I said the normally what what opens up the wallets is like this is an amazing brilliant student who is doing this kind of work isn't this really exciting now in order to be able to do more than that we need x amount of resources to happen please please give us these resources to make this happen right um so a lot of it is um is again like being as students being clear and and working together to articulate what it is that you most want and need and then as administrators our job is to remove the barriers prioritize things get the additional resources to make that happen. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Yeah, but... Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, you can go. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, I have a question. Um, thank you for being here, first and foremost. Um, I was uh, watching um, it was a, a lecture with Dr. Cornell West and Steve McQueen, and they were talking about Paul Robinson, mm-hmm. right? And I've been um, heavily interested in Paul Robinson. He was famous from like the 30s to like the 40s, and um, pretty much he was able to bridge the gap and cross the international waters and really connect with the Welsh, you know, um, the Russians, the Chinese. So how can we? As he was a socialist. Is, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he was a he was a Marxist and a socialist, so he was connecting. Like, what do we all have in common? The exploitation mm-hmm. of our labor. So let's like like let's gather around that and change. So go ahead. Exactly. Sorry. <laughs> well, 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 besides like the besides like the political part, as designers and as artists, how can we? Um, 
encourage other people to see themselves in other people, right? So when the Welsh looked at Robinson, they didn't look at him as just like, you know, this tall six foot something black man or whatever with the deep voice and can sing really well. You know, they looked at him as like one of them. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying, how can, how can artists and designers bridge that gap? Well, I say the best way for them to do that is to remember that they are human first. You are human beings first. Um, beautiful and manifest in all of what humanness might mean um, and in time. So you connect to people as, as human beings. Now, what you bring as an artist and designer is, again, certain kinds of perspectives, um, certain abilities to be able to communicate and share how the world works or how you see it or how you might experience it. Um, but you come, you come in interaction with people as as human beings as human beings and you connect around that like again i've i've traveled all around the world uh to the extent that one point in time i actually ran out of pages in my passport right um and and every place i go what i just make sure that i'm doing is like regardless of what people you know titles are or their jobs or all these other things is like how do i connect with them as a human being and it, and it even like not even be human centric about it. Like, how do I just connect in a sense of like being other energy in the universe that, you know, is is nourishing for me to be in connection with. Okay, so when you do that, everything else follows. And then again, like the, the differences that you have, like the differences in height, the differences in color, differences in rate. If you can sing, that's really good. Like all those differences then become like, part of sharing like it becomes the sharing and exchange of who you are and what things um what excites you about being alive what are the things that matter the most to you um and like i said design and art are just kind of um different lenses by which we sort of try to communicate that and try to understand that but we're still doing it from the perspective of the human being right Got it. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> My question is, there are so, you know, there are so many um, minority communities and, you know, not enough people to help them grow. Mm -hmm. But there are people with the drive to help these communities grow. However, like you said, um, the finance section of it is always a barrier. Mm -hmm. So what would be kind of like words of wisdom or of encouragement to help these people who want to help the minority communities like not give up and to keep going? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, so I guess I say the way I always try to do it is to just be present and be of use. Um, so again, you know, everyone has, I say, access to different to different resources, and money is just one resource. And there's a way in which, like, again, remember, in most cases, like, money is just a, um, it's a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an object of exchange for something else. Like, there's lots of situations in which I we do the work, and there's no exchange of money. Right. Because what people actually might need is like, say, they may need um, this is a situation in which people might need, um, you know, food. So I might cook or arrange for food to be sort of cooked in a community setting, like people bring what they have and whatever, whatever. Right. Because you're providing that sense of like community nourishment. Um, or it may be a situation where people just need a, a door opened, right? So I introduce them to someone else who, again, might have the resources that they need and I don't have. Um, so I think part of it is, is understanding that when you're in relationship to people that everyone has something that they can give and share, right? And then making the offer of that. like. For example, like when when community comes to to me at OCAD, like normally they're looking for three things. They're looking for like um, students that we want to work with because they're so brilliant and we want to like work with their brilliance. 
uh, uh, pre-COVID, they were looking for space because, you know, as a university, we give our space away pretty much for free. Um, and um, and sometimes they're looking for a, a door to be open. So again, in my position, sometimes I and I'm so I'm always shocked by it. It's like I make a call, and uh, and you know someone that seems inaccessible to a member of community, like they pick up the phone because it's me, and then I can then transfer that relationship to to the person in the community, and then again that opens up so many possibilities for them. So the thing I, I, I guess to say what I always, the way I always try to approach it and the way I try to encourage it to, again, my students and community is that like, we, we are the, what we all have is possibilities. So to what extent are you creating the conditions for possibilities for other people? And a lot of that is not money. Like money is just one aspect of that. Um, what are the ways in which you are opening up possibilities for a community to move in the direction that they want to be able to move in? And you'll be surprised, right? You'll be surprised by how many possibilities you can open up when you think about it as that, right? Like I'm just opening up possibilities. I don't have to be rich, don't have to be famous. I don't have to be whatever, whatever. Um, I just need to be able to create the conditions that opens up possibilities for them. And, and the beautiful thing about possibilities is that, again, it avoids that savior complex, right? Because like they have to define that that possibility is something that they want to pursue, right? And the relationship that gets built is them pursuing that possibility through and with you. Thank you so much for tuning in, guys. My name is Tyler. I'm going to be one of the admissions advisors helping you guys to start your creative careers here with the Miami Ad School with our four portfolio programs, art direction, copywriting, photography and video and design, as well as our boot camps. We are well equipped to make you well equipped for the creative industry. And my job is to help you transition smoothly from prospective to enrolled student. We have financial aid and scholarships available for all of our portfolio programs and our four U.S. locations, Miami, Atlanta, San Francisco, and New York, as well as our international locations are ready for you guys to go ahead and enroll when you are ready. So feel free to go to our website, www.miamiadschool.com, hit apply now, start your application, and if you have any questions, set up a call, and we will be happy to help you.